Welcome to Bake to the Future. The wholesale baking industry mixes tradition and innovation to feed the world and the economy, generating some major dough while employing nearly 800,000 people in the U.S. We bring you a fresh take on the latest trends and issues impacting the baking sector through exclusive insights and conversations. Brought to you by the American Bakers Association, who will take you Bake to the Future. Hi, welcome. I'm Haley Blumenreich. And I'm Katie Jewell. And today we are talking with baking industry supply chain leaders to learn about what the wheat growers and millers experienced during the pandemic and what they see going forward. Rob Mackey, the president and CEO of the American Bakers Association, is back with us today. And he is joined by Chandler Ghoul, CEO of the National Association of Wheat Growers, or NOG. Um, his group is the lead advocate for U.S. wheat farmers. And Chandler also oversees the National Wheat Foundation. And rounding out our distinguished panel is Jane DeMarchi, the president of NAMA, the North American Millers Association. And her association represents millers of wheat, corn, oats, and rye in the U.S. and Canada. And these three associations always work together to help ensure a safe and steady food supply. But from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the groups have worked even more closely to prevent breaks in the food supply chain and to help keep workers from field to fork safe. The bakery supply chain is so interconnected, and that's why we're excited to hear Chandler and Jane's perspective on the pandemic, some lessons learned, and what they see going forward. Rob, Jane, Chandler, all together, welcome to Bake to the Future. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Haley. So the format of today's show is a CEO discussion roundtable. So Haley and I are going to get out of the way until we come back at the end. But we have a few questions to ask before we hand over the mic. I've got the first tough question for our panelists, and Haley has the second. So Chandler and Jane, what is your favorite baked good? Jane, you first. Oh, I love all of them. That is a very (laughs) difficult question. But I would say uh, baguette, bagels, cookies, and donuts and cake. Okay. (laughs) So that sounds like more, well, I mean, you got some savories in there. So, you know, okay. But a lover of all the baked goods. Uh, Chandler, what about you? Well, I was going to say bagel and cream cheese and my smoked salmon, but she took that one from me. But I'll, I'll still go run with blueberry muffins. Okay. Okay. That's, that's fair. And Rob, <laughs> that is, it's always a good one. Rob, since we already know your favorite baked good, which is a key lime pie, um, another, this probably is not a tough question for you, but before we move on to Haley's tough question, I'm wondering who, where was the first bakery you ever visited? Oh my gosh. I would have been in junior high school and we did a field trip um, to a little bakery that made, you know, the French crusty rolls, um, and gosh, I was, like I said, I was in junior high and it was, it was amazing. Um, a couple of weeks later, we went to the hot dog manufacturing facility for our field trip. And it's a totally different experience after seeing that it was a while before you could have hot dogs again. Of course, now <laughs> not an issue, but, um, in junior high. All right. So junior high first bakery. All right. So Haley to you, tough questions. Yes. Uh, thank you for passing it over. Um, so we like to have our great bake to bake question, which is a food debate related to baked goods. And this episode, our question is, is a wrap a sandwich? Um, so sorry to just spring it on you, but Chandler, what do you think? Is a wrap a sandwich? Um, I'm going to go with, yes, it is. Because even though uh, it's, it's wrapped all the way around with the bread and you've got stuff in it and you can eat it with your hands. So I would say yes. Interesting. Jane. Yeah. Thoughts? I'm agreeing with Chandler on that one. That's d- definitely a sandwich and, and they're popular. So whatever, you know, we just want to keep people eating them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're, di- and it's different than a burrito. So it, it depends on what it's stuffed with and a wrap has got something different in it. That's what makes it also a sandwich. So. That's a very good question. I think we are going to have a great big debate about burritos. So, you know, start <laughs> start thinking about your answers there. And, and I, I think that if you actually Google, you know, is a wrap a sandwich, several um, taxing bodies, you know, so like New York State and, and different places like that believe that wraps are a sandwich. And so they tax it as such. So anyway, um, yeah, all sorts of fun things that we talk about here on, on Bake to the Future. <laughs> but I think that, uh, Haley, are you ready to hand it over to Rob? Yep. Over to you, Rob. 
Thanks. And thanks for not putting me on the spot this time um, with that tricky question. So, but I would have to agree with both Chandler and Jane. Uh, a wrap is a sandwich. I, I look to the house ethics guidelines. Um, so having it in your hand is really critical because uh, then it's not considered a meal. Um, so then we can actually serve sandwiches. Um, anyway, I digress. Um, thank you to Chandler. Thank you to Jane for joining us. Uh, we're really excited. Uh, it's just great to, to get this group together. We work so closely on so many different issues um, over the years. The whole wheat supply chain um, is enormously important. Um, I've said many, many times that we, our members, could not manufacture those healthy, fun, nutritious products, you know, without Chandler's members, you know, growing that high protein, high quality wheat and Jane's members milling that that product um, into the flour that we need to make all those wonderful deliciousness. So uh, really glad to have you on the program. I, I'm, I'm going to start off easy. Um, you know, I'll go to Chandler first. You know, what what's your sense, Chandler? How has the pandemic impacted your members? Um, you know, what, what kind of things are you hearing from your members about the impact of the pandemic in terms of the way they grow and harvest and get wheat to market? Well, uh, one of the main things that first came out <clears throat> as COVID began to come in and, and, and to crack down on the U.S., uh, we immediately started to see a decrease in our wheat price, which when you looked at what happened during COVID and the panic buying and, and the flour and all the baked goods just disappearing off the shelves, you know, I think a lot of people automatically um, – uh, connect that back to, well, the price of wheat must be going up. You know, we all know the basic supply and demand uh, that we learned in high school and college. But unfortunately, that's not how the market system works. Uh, we saw uh, multiple quarters of de declining prices. And then, of course, uh, we were worried about making sure that the supply chain uh, remained viable. I mean, we still had uh, our obligation to feed feed uh, the Americans, and then we also export 50% of our wheat. And so making sure that we had healthy farm workers uh, and the important thing that the government deemed farmers essential uh, was very critical for us being able to maintain that strong, steady uh, supply to our friends over at Jane's department, uh, to the millers, so that we could get y'all flour and other products to the baked goods. So uh, those have been the two biggest things that we really worked on at the very beginning. Great. Thank you, Chandler. Um, I, I know Jane is in a bit of a tough spot. Um, for those that don't know, Jane recently became the president of the North American Millers. Um, and although that being said, have known and worked with Jane and had great respect for Jane for many years. Um, she may be uh, the only person so far that's worked for two of the three legs of the wheat uh, supply chain. And, you know, who knows what the future holds, but um, it could make it three. But Jane, uh, you're, you're relatively new uh, to the flour milling business, but I'm sure you've had a lot of conversations with your members. What was sort of the, um, the overall impact to the, to the milling industry of the COVID pandemic? Sure. Thank, thanks, Rob. And don't worry, I'm uh, I'm safe at the Millers right now, so I'm not coming after your job to, so I can make it the, all three. Um, you know, I wanted to say that it, what Chandler said is so important, the fact that Millers and all of food and agriculture were deemed essential was critically important for our ability to continue to supply both, you know, the bakers and also um, American families with the food that they want. And, and and I think the real lesson from the pandemic is that people love bread and grain-based foods, and they find comfort and convenience in them. And, you know, for our part, we're the link between the farmers and the bakers, and we take that really seriously. And going forward, our companies are investing in their production um, to make sure that we can continue to be that vital link and keep supplying uh, bakers and, and supplying people with family flour as well. That's great, Jane. Um, I want to go back to Chandler because you raised a really good point about um, about the wheat availability. Um, it was interesting that we got calls from the media where we were saying, are we going to run out of, of bread products? And I said to them many times, as long as the wheat growers continue to grow wheat and, and the millers can mill it, there will be no run on on bread products. But, but Chandler, was, was there ever any any doubt in your mind that we were going to have enough supply of wheat grown in the U.S.? 
We were going to have plenty of wheat. Uh, we, we were coming out of the field and, you know, we were looking at weather patterns as well because that can be an issue. But uh, in 2020, now that the wheat production is and harvest is done, we produced roughly 1.8 billion bushels of wheat, which is plenty to meet our domestic demand uh, needs and also uh, our international demands. As you know, we, we export 50 percent of the wheat uh, raised here in the United States. And so um, we planted, uh, we were estimated to plant about 45 million acres. Uh, we ended up with about 43. So you're exactly right. As long as the weather held out, so COVID wasn't our only issue. As long as the weather held out, we were going to have plenty of wheat to continue uh, through the supply chain. So there would not be a shortage. That's great. And then Jane, I know that um, I can't tell you how many interviews that, that we ended up doing. Um, and the issue was always access to the, the home baking flour, the all-purpose flour, Um, we're getting ready to, you know, we're here in the middle of the holiday season and, you know, obviously home baking is, is a big piece of that. Are are we, are we at any risk of running out of of flour at the grocery stores? No, I don't think we are. You know, this last few months has been an opportunity for our companies to really drill down on their supply chains and they've been investing in additional production lines. And I guess it's important to add, just as Chandler was saying and you were saying, you know, we, the flour was there. It was a matter of getting it you know, from the mill to the grocery store. And so making sure that we have enough packaging and packaging lines, and then also making sure that our transportation is dialed in so we can get the the products all the way to the grocery store shelves is uh, hugely important for our members going forward. You know, Jake, that was one of the issues that we ran into a little bit at the very beginning when all the states Nobody had any direction, and we had uh, individual municipalities that were putting in restrictions, and we actually had some of our farmers hauling their grain to an elevator or maybe to a mill, and they got stopped because they were traveling after curfew. This is because, you know, we start harvesting um, wheat, you know, in March, and then we harvested almost, but we just finished up a couple weeks ago. And so that and that communication not only between our organizations and who we represent but state and local municipalities to make sure we don't disrupt that that supply chain it was very critical at the beginning yeah that's a great point chandler and and i know that you know we had uh bakers that um their skilled workforce was just trying to get to work um and we were able to we came up with a system of uh, certification letters that they could carry with them so if they were pulled over by the state police so that you know, local sheriff, they could get to work to make the products. Um, and then clearly on the back end, you know, you still have to get it into, you know, the restaurants and retail grocery stores. And so we had, we had to develop, you know, all of this is sort of on the fly. We ended up having to develop these cert- certificates that our, our route sales reps could take with them uh, for the same reasons. Uh, I, I would say as we're sort of sitting here, you know, in the winter, months, uh, we're, we're hearing more and more, you know, New Mexico is a big case right now, um, the Chicago land area where we're seeing, you know, some lockdowns happening again or starting to happen. And so, you know, the need, I think, for some of those certificates, uh, again, is going to be necessary. Um, so it's going to be something uh, definitely worth watching, you know, over the winters as we get through this. Um, let me let me ask this, Chandler. What what about the uh, the export markets? Uh, have those held fairly strong uh, for your members? Well, um, they're coming back, and that is that's another reason that we've also seen a decrease uh, a, a, a decrease in our wheat price. Um, you know, the two years that we didn't sell anything to China uh, has really caused a large uh, worldwide increase of wheat stock. So we've got that setting over. Uh, all of us right now. Uh, China has come back through to the phase one uh, agreement that the Trump administration uh, negotiated, and they have actually surpassed where they would would have been um, during a normal trading year when it comes to wheat. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, We continue to monitor the UK trade agreement and also the trade agreement uh, that's being uh, developed in Kenya. Um, though Kenya is not going to be a huge export market for us uh, at NOG, we definitely feel that that is going to be an agreement that's going to be the template for other 
African countries uh, that definitely have uh, the potential to be major export markets for us. But then again, the bulk of our attention is really on that Asian Pacific realm where the middle class is growing and the need for uh, better protein uh, products is growing. And and a lot of those were TPP countries. And so we're, we're encouraging uh, the Biden uh, administration as they come in to uh, re-examine a lot of those countries over there for U.S. wheat products. Oh, that's great. Um, and, and I'm glad to hear that because, you know, at the end of the day, we need a very strong and sustainable uh, grower community, um, not only, you know, for the domestic use, but obviously for international in order to continue to get, you know, again, the high quality, high protein wheat flour that we need uh, to make the incredible bakery products that we make. Uh, Jane, I want to one of the things that we're hearing about is and we went through this in the springtime and, and reach out to FDA, as you recall, where, you know, some of the, the ingredients, the minor ingredients that, that go into the milling process and then clearly into the baking process um, could have become in short supply. Some of those coming, you know, from international sources. Are you hearing from your members at all uh, growing concerns? Again, as we're getting into the winter months, um, are, are supplies uh, becoming an issue um, in terms of some of those minor ingredients? Oh, thanks for bringing that up. I think that we're finding that the, our worst fears did not um, come to fruition and that we're in good shape going forward. You know, I did want to bring up one point as we were talking a little bit about transportation and logistics. You know, as we look towards the future and, and what might be coming down the pike, I know, you know, in... Um, in the previous COVID months, you know, there was some flexibility around truck transportation and loads of trucks, weight loads for trucks. And, you know, I think that's something the three of us should continue to keep our eyes on as well, because if transfer, you know, if logistics do start to become tight again, I think that's an easy answer to making more flexibility in terms of truck weights to, to put more um, things on the road. Oh, that's great. I, I, I agree with you. I think the whole logistics and transportation sector, which which took a significant hit um, in the early stages of COVID. I mean, that's all, you know, as we sort of think about lessons learned, you know, having more flexibility in those supply chain operations and logistics is going to be really important, Jane. That's a great point. Are, are there other, Jane, are there other, you know, takeaways that you're looking for, you know, in terms of what the millers are going to do differently, lessons learned out of the COVID pandemic? Well, one thing I wanted to bring up, you had asked about home baking, and the Home Baking Association worked with Mintel to do some market research about sort of what is the online conversation about baking. And I think it's really a positive for all of us how much interest there was in baking over those COVID months. And I expect we'll see it as in the holiday season and coming up as well. I mean, and people really found that they took solace in baking and it provided them with a sense of control and a way to show sort of their compassion and love for other people. And I think, and also younger people are getting into baking. So you've got your 18 to 34 year olds that are really getting into baking. And I think for all of us, that really shows that that love for the people have for grain based foods. And I, and I think that's something that'll be good for all of us going forward. Yeah, Jane, how do we sustain that? You raise a great point. We've, we've talked about with other folks that have been on the podcast um, and, and definitely we'll be looking at this question in 2021 is how do we how do we take advantage? It sounds like a horrible way to put it, but, you know, how do we build on the momentum of this renewed connection that we have with consumers where just to be honest, a year ago we were struggling with? Well, I mean, I think we do need to dive in as a broad-based industry to really continue to promote our products. I mean, we've, let's be honest, we've been on the defense for a number of years, and now we're in a different position where we can be a little bit more taking advantage of the enthusiasm. And I think my guess is that as people move back towards working in offices and things like that, they, they won't have as much time for the home baking, but hopefully they'll remember, you know, the product that they they enjoyed baking and and will be buying those in the in the grocery store and also in food service I mean I think the the upside hopefully will be that the food service industry comes roaring back because they are certainly you know still being challenged right now 
No, they're they're being slammed. I'm sure we've all seen the the National Restaurant Association study, you know, that indicated maybe up to twenty five percent of their members uh, may not survive um, through COVID. And I think we need to do everything that we can. Obviously, it's a big segment uh, for the baking industry um, and and the entire supply chain. And so, you know, we're exploring working with NRA, you know, on some creative ideas. Um, you know, I would just say to anybody listening to this, if you love your favorite restaurant, that ought to be reason enough to wear your mask and socially distance, because the longer this goes on, the more stress our favorite restaurants are going to be under and, and nobody wants to see them, you know, go by the wayside. Um, Chandler, I'm going to come to you. Um, any any differences? Do you see any differences um, as we kind of work through and come out on the backside of, of the pandemic in terms of the way your members do business? Um, and, and a lot of folks don't realize how sophisticated, you know, I like to hold up, you know, your members and other farmers. I mean, these are the smartest business people in the world. Do you think about, you know, investing months ahead of time on a hopeful return that's weather dependent and a whole lot of other things dependent. So I'm sure your members have had some uh, some pretty good thoughts in terms of how are they going to adjust their business from lessons learned during the pandemic? Well, most definitely. And, and uh, that was a key point that I wanted to bring up. So I appreciate you uh, tossing this question over to me, Rob. Uh, I think what we have demonstrated through COVID, uh, whether it's through the panic buying and, and, and of course, the horrible situation that our restaurant uh, and service industries in that both you and Jane just commented on. I think a lot of Americans, you know, they're now six and seven generations removed from the farm when, you know, 100 years ago, almost half the population was somehow uh, directly involved in some type of agriculture production. And and I think we're really able to demonstrate now not only how um, involved and specialized and, and complicated our food system is. I mean, uh, so many Americans go to the grocery store. They always expect their food to be there, their bread to be there. Uh, you go to a restaurant, you order something off a menu, and it shows up at your table. But the millions of jobs that are connected to get that wheat, you know, uh, from actually from genetics into the ground, harvested to a mill, milled, packaged, and then, you know, onto uh, one of your members, Rob, and then either out through a grocery store or, or a restaurant industry. You know, it's really just shown that we have got to make sure that we've got good public policy that helps us um, uh, in pandemic situations like this. I think we've definitely realized the importance, again, of our transportation system. And then also uh, that we need to continually be prepared for to keep not only farm workers safety, but workers in, in, in the mills and the bakeries uh, safe as well. And so I think there's just been a, a lot of opportunities. I think that we need to turn this into some positives to learn here. Because I don't think this is going to be the last time this is going to happen to us, uh, especially as the world population continues to grow. So we need to learn every single thing we can from this one so that when the next one, not if, uh, but when it comes around, uh, we can still guarantee the safety, not only of of our workers and and of our um, uh, citizens, but also the safety of our food supply. Channel, that's a great point. You know, we've talked about, you know, offline many times, you know, to the point you made about people being so removed, you know, from where their food comes from. And and, and while it was a, an on-trend issue um, last year, my sense is that, that, you know, I guess because they've got more time on their hands or because they're doing things like home baking and, you know, clearly the prevalence around baking and, and cooking shows and, and on the Internet and YouTube. Um, I think there's a lot more awareness. Um, that is a great point about demystifying our food supply. You know, we often talk about you drive by, you know, a bakery um, and it's just a box and people don't know what goes on inside the box. And and that leads to, you know, confusion and, and in some cases, misinformation. What do you think, Chandler, and, and have Jane comment on this? What else can we do uh, to continue to educate, you know, American consumers that may live in an urban center, where does their bread or their blueberry muffin or where all of that comes from? What else can we be doing? Well, um, you know, one of the things I know when we were starting up the conversation this morning, uh, Rob, they asked you how old you were the first time you went to a a bakery and you said you were in junior high. And I remember the first time I went to a bakery, I was already working um, uh, for Congress up on the Hill. And uh, back then before GMA, I think it was the Food Processing Association, uh, took all of us to Chicago. And we went to Nabisco's 
uh, bakery and watch those Oreos come off that conveyor belt, all still hot and gooey, um, <clears throat> which is still one of my favorite trips that I've ever uh, been on in my entire life because we got to eat hot Oreos. But um, I think really, really what we need to do between the farmers and the millers and the bakers is we've got to find out or uh, some type of television educational way to demonstrate not only the complexity, but the safety uh, of our food system and just a actually how much care goes into it. And I think it's something that I think that's why you're starting to see more and more value chain discussions because you we always talk about the silo effect of you know the growers i sit here and talk to the corn growers the soybean growers and the you know the cattlemen but really what i need to be talking to are to the the supply chain to my left which is you know jane and the millers and you and the bakers and then even further out you know the food marketing institute and the grocery stores of of making this information readily available but also understandable. I mean, because we can all get in our own jargon jar and talk so much that we don't even understand. You, you have to be an expert in the industry to understand what we're talking about. And I think it's crucial that we start to not only educate the consumer, but we need to bring this down into the education, like uh, pre-K through 12. And, and, and we've moved away from educating kids about where their food comes from, unless it's through a special program or a foundation activity. And so I think those are two major areas that, uh, all of agriculture and food uh, industries could work on in educating about the food system. Well, and I would say I, I could not agree with you more, Chandler. And, and I go back to that high school or the junior high trip. Um, and that's something that we've really, you know, impressed upon our members is, you know, reconnect with those school groups and the scouting groups and, and what have you. Um, it, it's so valuable. But even, you know, even on Capitol Hill, you know, we've I know we've worked together on, and you all have taken the lead on, you know, doing some educational opportunities to interface and get to sort of touch and feel all the different steps of the wheat supply chain. Um, that's just enormously valuable. You sort of demystify it. You know, people get to, you know, see it and understand it. And, and like you said, you know, do away with the jargon. One of the things I would love to do, and then I want to get Jane's take on this. One of the things I would absolutely love to do is to take um, some of your members, Chandler, and and some of Jane's members and our members, and, and do an entire supply chain tour. So we go to the wheat field, we see where the wheat's grown and how it's harvested, take it to the mill, you know, and see how that process works. And then obviously through a bakery, but but where I think the real rubber meets the road is, is to get inside retail grocery stores. And, you know, I know a number of retailers have had an opportunity in my career to participate in some of these where you do interactions with consumers in the bakery aisle and, and, get, and understand you know, what's on their mind, you know, get their questions um, directly. And I think if, if we were all to partner on something like that, it would be enormously valuable and, and really to fully understand, you know, where consumers uh, are and so we can meet them where they are. Jane, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I think one thing that's really important to remember is there's not a monolithic consumer, right? There's so many different types of consumers with different interests. And I know, um, you know, my kids are college aged and looking at things like TikTok and other influencers. And so, you know, how do you target younger people is going to be different than how you, you target older people. I know there's tremendous interest in, um, in uh, cooking careers, right? It, being chefs and things like that. And those are another great source of allies for us to talk about the, the great products that we have. So I think this is one of the reasons why we all need to work together because there are so many different kinds of consumers who need different things. And there are certainly a, a big chunk that are interested in sustainability, and the environment, and they want to know what Chandler's members are doing on the farm and how that carries through all the way through to the bakery. So, so our, we do have our work cut out for us to figure out how we can have multiple different types of education going at the same time to target different types of consumers. And then I just wanted to add one more point, which is the, the re R and D side of this is so critical for all of us. And we're all working on 
things. And I think it's really important to note that even as the industry has been going through this tremendous experience through the pandemic, that R&D has continued on, um, you know, be it seed companies working on wheat or the mills expanding and, and working on, on their own products and your members too. So, our, you know, I just think it's really important to, to remember that we're not, you know, sitting on the sidelines. Everybody's continuing to do all the work that needs to be done. That's a great point, Jane, and, and a lot of work yet needs to be done. Um, I think what I'd like to do is, uh, and I think we could have a whole nother podcast where it's talking about some of the, the innovations and the technology pieces uh, going forward. So I'd love to have you guys back um, and have that conversation. Um, I, I want to wrap um, and would be very remiss if I didn't take this opportunity. Um, we, in the last election, uh, we ended up losing um, one of the all-time champions uh, for agriculture uh, and for the food industry. Um, and, and while we may not have always seen eye to eye with Colin Peterson, uh, the Ag Committee Chair, on some issues, um, we knew that on the vast majority of important issues, we could really count on him to be a strong voice uh, on behalf of not only agriculture, but food. Chandler, I know you have a very special, close relationship um, with Chairman Peterson. I'd like to sort of give you the last word. You know, anything that we should know, our members respectively should know about Colin Peterson and the great work that he did on behalf of all Americans uh, with food and ag. Uh, Most definitely, Robin, and I appreciate the opportunity to let me talk about Chairman Peterson. Um, I, I did work in his personal office and then spent Uh, six years on the House Agriculture Committee with him uh, as the ranking member and then when he became chairman. And I honestly can say in the 20 years that I have been doing food and agriculture policy in Washington, D.C., I don't think I have ever met another member who has a better understanding not only of production practices, but the economics behind it and how to build good public policy across the aisle. I mean, uh, Chairman Peterson was uh, oftentimes called the most conservative or most uh, bipartisan uh, Democrat in the House of Representatives. And I'm going to take it even just a little step further. I just think that this continued division that we see in the United States, we are eliminating the middle of both parties. We're eliminating those bipartisan or what you want to call them conservative Democrats or blue dogs. But we're doing the same thing on the Republican side. And, And to be honest, when we're moving forward in agriculture policy without Chairman Peterson there to be that link bridge and just that institutional knowledge, Um, I encourage all of us to get up to the Hill as soon as the new Congress is seated. We have got a lot of education to do. Uh, His his, um, absence is going to be deeply felt, and it's even going to be felt more when that 2023 Farm Bill discussion starts back up. That's an excellent point, Chandler. Thank you again for sharing that. And thank you, everybody. This is Katie jumping back in again as we wrap up the podcast. Um, It sounds like there is certainly a lot of work to do um, on the communications front. And and it's good to hear that the industries, I know none of the industries are resting on their laurels during this um, pandemic. Um, R&D is continuing and and perhaps we could use this as an opportunity while while we're kind of in a holding pattern to kind of come up with some plans of how our uh, sectors, our interconnected sectors could come up with some uh, some. cool things that we could do to help educate the consumers and also uh, new folks up on the Hill over the next few years. So thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you enjoyed this episode, I'd suggest listening to our episode with our food industry partners, the International Dairy Foods Association, IDFA, and the North American Meat Institute, NAMI, NAMI, and about that was about how they fared during the pandemic. Um, And also our last episode, I also recommend about the 2020 election results and what they might mean for the baking industry. And I want to remind everyone to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, and Ghana. And don't forget to take the great bake debate about (laughs) uh, wraps being sandwiches. Um, And that's at baketothefuture.org slash debate. Bake to the Future is brought to you by the American Bakers Association in partnership with Human Factor. To hear upcoming and past episodes, go to baketothefuture.org. Bake to the Future is produced by Haley Blumenreich. Audio engineer is Blake Alton. 
and a slice of the action is written by the American Bakers Association's Government Relations Team.